And so it's those, it's that type of thinking in terms of scale that people really need to think through. Are we doing the absolute best that anybody could do? I, I don't know. I don't necessarily think so. I think we can always improve. But as a small company and learning to scale, you really have to think about what kind of things do you keep internally and what kind of things do you have externally? Yeah. All of our HR is outsourced, right? All of our benefits, uh, you know, th that type of stuff. So we focus on our core business and then we partner and outsource for the rest because we're a technology company. We don't do consulting. We work with guys like um, like Accenture and big consulting firms to do the consulting around our technology because we're not consultants, we're technology nerds, right? And so we're just really mission critically focused so that we can so that we can be as effective in scale as quickly as possible. Welcome to the Building to Scale podcast, where we bring real entrepreneur stories that showcase the challenges and successes in building and scaling an entrepreneurial business. Our host, Jeff Chastain, is a business transformation coach with Admentis, where he coaches business leaders and their teams with a proven set of principles and tools, helping them gain clarity in and get more of what they want from their business. Make sure to stick around until the end of the show, and we will reveal how you can become our next guest. Hello, everybody. Jeff Chastain here with the Building to Scale podcast again, where I get the opportunity really to speak with entrepreneurial business leaders, growth-minded leaders who are working to grow and scale their own companies. And some of the we'll discuss some of the challenges, some of the excesses as they've had over the years working through that. Uh, today's guest with me here is Tony Nash with Complete Intelligence out of the Houston, Texas area. So first off, Tony, welcome to the show and thank you for taking a few minutes out of your busy day to join us here. Thanks, Jeff. I appreciate the opportunity. So give us a little bit about what Complete Intelligence is and what you guys have got going on there. Sure. We run an artificial intelligence platform. We use it to uh, forecast market activity, say currencies, commodities, equities for investors, um, we also help people, companies understand their costs and their revenues, which are really important on the budgeting side. So we help people de-risk their future business decisions by understanding um, where their costs are going to go and where their revenues will likely go. Okay. So I've got a background in technology and we kind of talked about AI and stuff beforehand, but if we were to bring that down and say, okay, I, I put you on the spot here, but it was mm -hmm. one of the networking questions I've heard before. Like, okay, if you describe that to a five-year-old, what do you really do? So I know we kind of talked beforehand that this is typically big enterprise focus, but for those that are not in that industry or not dealing with nine, 10 figure dollar budgets, kind of a thing, budget planning, what does that really mm -hmm. mean from a, obviously from a company, your size or your perspective? Sure. If I have to describe it to a five or 10 year old, uh, you know, I'd say, look, if you run a lemonade stand, you have to understand how much the lemons are going to cost, how much the water is going to cost, how much the sugar is going to cost. You also want to understand how many customers you're going to have, how much money they're going to spend, you know, how much money you're going to take in through the lemonade stand, right? So we work with customers to understand all of those things. Now, when companies themselves forecast this stuff, and we know this from talking to our clients, they typically have 30% error rates or worse, even for raw materials costs. So their planning is way off, okay? When you look at industry experts, investment banks, economists, uh, industry experts, these sorts of things, their uh, error rates are typically 20% off, okay? Our error rates are typically about around 4.6%. OK, and that's on an absolute percent error basis. So we're not gaming the pluses and minuses. OK, so if you're buying those lemons and that sugar and that sort of thing, um, you can pay a dollar 20 for it for us. You know, maybe it'd be a dollar five or something like that. Right. So we'll help you save 15 cents a lemon. OK, yeah. um, and you'll understand where those costs are going. Um, and so when you scale that up to very large customers who have you know, $2 billion, $5 billion, $20 billion in turnover or more, they're, they're buying in tens and hundreds of millions of dollars. So let's say a 17% improvement in their ability to forecast things. Those are very large numbers. Uh, and so we're working with enterprise scale data in the cloud and helping them understand where their business is going 
And I would say probably better than just about anybody else out there. And so it doesn't have to be, you know, the biggest company in the world doing this stuff. We work with mid-sized companies as well. Okay. Because we'll take data out of their, um, you know, their enterprise planning system or something like that. um, And we'll use it on our platform to help them make better decisions. We're not telling them what to do. We're just telling them where the data tell us that things are going to go. So the real problem we're solving, aside from the obvious of what's going to happen in their markets and their costs, every company has a very painful budgeting process, okay? Some companies, it takes a month or two or three months. Some companies, some of our customers, it takes six or seven months. And they're going through in a very meticulous way planning their budgets. And there are hundreds of people involved. And at the end of the day, it goes up to the CFO and the CPO, the chief procurement officer, or the CFO and the head of sales. And it's a verbal agreement on what's actually going to happen. Not all that data driven, right? And so what we do is we give them a straw man to base it on. So they can, a very meticulous and detailed straw man. So that seven month process is taken down to a couple days, okay, from data transmission to processing to sending back. And they also get a continuous budgeting exercise, okay? Every month we'll re-forecast their budgets for them. So if something like COVID happens as it did last March, April, we can help them understand what's likely to happen uh, in their business. No, that makes sense. And that's really one of those things that regardless of the business size, that it's like, okay, having actual real data, not seven month old data, actually having it on a monthly basis or even closer kind of a thing, you can actually make real decisions on it at that point, rather than just thinking, like you said, when COVID happened, everybody had their budget set January, February for what 2020 was going to be. And now two months later, they're completely invalidated that either the, like you said earlier, some, some businesses are up, some are down, some are pulling back the, the, the expenses. So it may have turned out okay, but all the planning they did initial on is completely out of the window at that point. Right. And most of those guys, their revenue budgets were blown out. Like they, they had no idea what was going to happen there. They were saddled with their cost budgets that they had to continue paying for all this stuff. They didn't know what was coming in on the top line. And so they then had to be very reactive on the, on the cost side. Um, and initially it was just a lot of, you know, arbitrary cost cutting and no disrespect to anybody. They were doing the best they could. Right. But a lot of these big companies initially were just like, we don't know what what we're going to be in three months. We were initially told COVID was four to six weeks and, you know, it's still going on. Right. And so what we saw is a lot of companies cut costs in the second quarter and the third quarter. And by the end of the third quarter, the management teams looked up and said, well, we've cut it as much as we can through the first three quarters. Let's not release any more budget in Q4. So that just helped them on the income side so that they, you know, their bottom line looked better than it probably would have if they would have been a status cooperation. Yeah. Uh, but still, um, you know, what we're doing is using actual live data to help clients make the actual decisions that they need to make to run their businesses. Yeah. And that's really, to me, the key, whether you're, whether you've got the small business that, you simply just don't have that much data to be processing all the way up to the enterprise. It's still the same thing of saying, okay, making those decisions on the numbers rather than like you said, with, with COVID where it's almost a, an immediate knee jerk panic reaction of, Hey, we got to cut things or, Hey, we everything's going to be down. It's like, okay, let's look at the numbers and hopefully by a Q2, Q3, et cetera, we've got some actual real data that we can start looking at. So, but yeah, that's, that's interesting. So going back to uh, complete right. intelligence then, Take us back, I would say, I think you said at one point six to seven years old for the company itself. So how did this, how did this kind of come about from a, an entrepreneurial standpoint? Sure. Yeah, I, I used to run um, global research for a company called The Economist based in the UK, a uh, publishing company. Um, and then I moved to a company called IHS Market, which was just bought by S&P about six months ago. Um, I was their Asia head of consulting. I was working with clients on a lot of data-driven decisions. And what clients were telling me were two things. First, um, the, the forecasts that everyone was doing, not just us, us, were wrong. And there was no accountability for that, okay? The second is they could never get a forecast for their exact decisions. 
forecasts were always too high level or not the right thing or something. So I, I rolled out of uh, IHS market saying, um, I want to have a data-driven company that actually helps people make real decisions about their business. And so we started as a consulting firm. For our first few years, we were a consulting firm. And, you know, I was trying to understand the types of decisions that people needed to make. I knew it from my consulting days with bigger firms, but I wanted to understand what we could actually do. Um, about three years in, we decided to turn into a product firm which is a very different type of business. And so, you know, we built an initial platform that was very customizable, but then to productize it out, to build it to scale, really is a very different skill set. Aside from a little bit math and a little bit of code, it's a very different, say, marketing and sales operation. It's a very different, um, you know, infrastructure and all that stuff, right? So, uh, so uh, a couple of years ago, we decided to productize with some subscription, online subscription data products. And then we've got more uh, specific with, say, cost and revenue products. So um, I started the company in Asia, in Singapore. And then in 2017, we moved to Texas. So um, part of our, uh, my calculation there was um, the talent, in my mind, is better here in the U.S., uh, the customers uh, are much easier to access here in the U.S. And the business environment is pretty friendly. So it was a pretty easy decision for us uh, to decide to come to Texas. Interesting. Okay. So what what kind of challenges or what, what did you face in going from, uh, well, I guess I, I don't necessarily know what your role was when you were saying with The Economist, et cetera. I'm assuming you're, you're managing a team, but you're not necessarily managing a company at that point to now owning and running your own company here with uh, you said what, 10, 10, 11 something employees up to now? Yes, that's right. That's right. I think, so, you know, first is always um, the administrative part of it, right? I mean, I think every new business owner just isn't aware of the administrative stuff. And also the fear of missing something, right? What have I not done? What, what tax filing have I not done? Or, you know, something like that, right? So there's always that, which was, not a, not a major issue, but it was an additional burden. Um, when I think the, the biggest part of it was, you know, I was just doing everything. Um, and, uh, and you come as a, as a business owner, you come to a point where you're doing everything and you're involved in everything. And then you come to a point where you have to delegate stuff and finding the right balance of when to do that. Um, and how to do that is, I would say it's more art than science. And, um, you know, other things like scaling our IT infrastructure, that's never really a decision I'd made before. Um, I'm, a, I'm a math nerd and economics and data nerd, right? So, you know, those types of decisions were really, um, were really new. But also on the customer side, although I had been customer facing, when, and this is kind of a no brainer, of course, but when you don't have a big brand behind you, um, getting to the right people is a much more difficult process. And so we, I knew that coming out of the gate, but I underestimated how hard it would be. We started talking with some of our sales partners right away, knowing that they wouldn't give us a yes right away, but starting the relationship. So guys like Oracle, guys like Bloomberg, Microsoft, uh, Refinitiv, Thomson Reuters. These guys are all major partners for us now, major sales channel partners. Um, and it took us four to five years to get those relationships moving and commercialized. So for a small business owner who is looking at channels as a major part of their business strategy, um, I would recommend you have to start talking to those partners right now like a year or two or three before you intend on getting your first dollar. Um, and so the other part as we've grown is we've had to think through what do we do well as a company and what's best for us to outsource. So things like HR, you know what? We don't have an HR team. We have an outsourced HR firm, right? That's a no brainer, but uh, you know, I can't do it all myself. I don't know the laws and stuff. So we have outsourced HR. As I said, with our channels, we are scaling up our sales force, but to have that as a kind of a force multiplier is huge for us, right? 
And things like marketing, we have a marketing team in the Philippines uh, and we have some marketing here, but where can we get great skills at the you know, best price really, right? And so you know, we have to look around to find out you know, what that stuff looks like. We don't have any of our data science team or any of our developers offshore. Um, they're all here in the US and part of that is for our client base. We don't want things going to Eastern Europe or Asia or whatever, but where we can push things off and, and um, make sure that we keep our core business, we're happy to push things off. And so what I mean is we are a technology company, okay? We are not a human resources company. We are not a marketing company. Um, and we're not a consulting firm. And so we partner or outsource so that we can stay small and scale, but do it very, very well. Yeah. And, and really, even still, that's giving you the ability to scale because you're not having to hire in, like you said, a whole team of HR. It's a lot more cost effective, especially for a smaller business to say, hey, we're going to go pay a much smaller fraction of that to, a, to an outsource group. Still allows you to scale and grow the business, but at a much lower cost at that point. Right. So kind of what was that? Was, did you just walk into that and say, oh, day one, we're just not going to do HR. We're just not going to do marketing, et cetera. Or was that kind of a, a transition process? Because I know a lot of people will, will try to do some of it before they finally throw up their hands and say, OK, yeah, this is not us. Or how quickly did you make that handoff there? That was immediate. I knew we didn't want to do that from the start. Um, just from my corporate experience, I knew that that wasn't something I knew that we would spend a lot of money there, not necessarily get good value. And so when somebody is a vendor, you can, you know, you need some output, you need some outcomes. And so, um, so we just chose to make some of those guys vendors instead of making them full-time employees. So I'm curious, uh, since obviously you're a numbers driven company, accounting, stuff like that, what does your relationship with some of these vendors look like? How, how much of a, a, numbers kind of basis relationship or are you dealing with them or are they is that more free flowing um well i think when you say numbers basis what what do you mean by that i'm sorry uh, a lot of times i'll work with uh companies to sit here and say okay we've still got to measure our return on roi kind of a thing on everything right. so do we have specific numbers do we have specific milestones sure. measurables etc tied to outside vendors the same way as we'd have tied to an employee oh yeah Absolutely. So like with our HR, you know, our outsourced HR vendor, what we get from them on a monthly basis, you know, I would probably have to hire a couple of people to do internally. It just doesn't make sense for us. The, the, the fully loaded FTE costs are just way too much. Um, on, on the marketing side, unless somebody has absolutely stellar marketing skills, a lot of the direct marketing campaigns, um, social media marketing, all that stuff, for a firm our size, at least, it just doesn't make sense to hire somebody. We can direct that activity, manage it every day, that sort of thing. But the execution of it um, is better outsourced because we can do better with an outsourced vendor, like dramatically better um, than we can by hiring those people directly, right? And so, and so, and we're not talking a small kind of, we're saving 20%. We're saving a lot more than that by hiring uh, marketing people directly. Yeah. No, so, that makes sense. Yeah. And so, so I think, again, with most of the decisions we make, we really question how core is that to our business? Um, does it add to the technology? Does it add to the customer relationship? Um, and that's really what it comes down to. So I think we're, you know, we're at a place with things like video calls and, um, with a lot of the other technology that's come around over the last 10 years where you don't necessarily need that. Uh, you don't need everything in-house. It's just not necessary. And if I have a vendor, then I don't necessarily have to pay for them to learn. If somebody is on staff, I have to pay for them to learn. And so it's not necessarily all fully productive time, right? And so, again, we're, we're a very results-oriented company. Uh, and so, again, we think through all that stuff. So for the guys who are watching your podcast, I would say, look, you know, if you're growing a company, you really need to think through what your headcount expectations are. What are they doing? Can you get that outsourced? Do you absolutely need to hire that person or can you turn it into, uh, you know, an invoice? Yeah. 
And that's that's really the the key, because I see a lot more today of having a lot more availability and options of those outsourcing kind of a thing, that it's, it's not just necessarily the one big accounting firm that you had to be local face to face meeting somebody with the technology these days. I, I can have my accountant on the other side of the, the country kind of a thing, and it's just no big deal. Or I can have a marketing right. firm, like you said, all the way over in the Philippines. It's no big deal right. at that point. So it's almost, it, it's driven competition in those fields for sure. So it, it's really almost like you said, a no brainer that, okay, why would you, why would you want to go build your own in-house marketing firm when you're a, a technology company or when you're right. a, a financial services company, something like that? It's like, you, that's not your core business, but still really identifying that core business is, is obviously the key there. Right. So talking about that core business, you said you kind of made a, an evolutionary change there with, within your own company of saying, okay, consulting to now today being the, the 100% product focus. What did, that, what did that process look like? Or I guess for that matter, why did you necessarily say, because a lot of people, I was, that was my own background coming out of car, uh, corporate America was, okay, we're going to go be a consultant kind of a thing. So how did you go from the consultant to saying, okay, we need to do something different or something sure. transitioning towards the product side? Yeah, it's very simple. As a consultant, my upside is limited. I only have so many hours in the week and I can only bill against those hours. And if I hire people, the upside is limited for them, right? So, and if I want to grow a large revenue base, I then have to hire a lot of people and then add X percent on top of their cost. And, you know, if their time isn't sold, then I can't hire them anymore, right? So, um, so I just got really tired of being the main guy consulting uh, and, you know, billing against my hours. And so we productized because, you know, I wanted to make sure we could scale the kind of intellectual property that was in my head and, um, and build that out as much as possible. Now, that process was a, it took a lot longer than I thought and a lot longer than I had hoped. That transition really took 18 months to two years. So, you, because, you know, I had resources that were helping us on client engagements. I had to take them off of client engagements so they weren't revenue generating to develop the IP around our product business because they can't do both, okay? They can't serve clients and develop IP because the, the development of IP always gets put off. And so, you know, I had to make, a, as a business owner, I had to make a very hard decision to say, we're going to stop, you know, selling right now, okay? And I'm going to pay the cost on these resources to develop this capability so that we can then productize it in 18 months time. And that was a very, very hard decision. <clears throat> but we did it because we had to. Otherwise, I would have been flying all over, working, you know, 90 hours a week, you know, all that stuff. And we did it. We bit the bullet and we came out with some pretty amazing capability. Oh, and that's really the key to me of, of saying, yes, it's a longer term vision. You're playing the longer game there, even like you were talking about with the channel partners. OK, you, you've got to start investing in things now, looking towards that that longer term goal. And if you're only looking towards next quarter, next month, even next year, you might not necessarily have made that change to go product because you're just looking at, OK, how, how can we get more billable revenues here in the next quarter? Okay. So yeah, it's it's looking at that. So kind of going down that direction, what does what does the vision look like for for complete intelligence? What, how do you define vision from a company perspective, and what's your what's your bigger picture vision there? Since it obviously sounds like you're one to to look longer term than just focusing on the immediate short term. Yeah, I think so. So our focus is really to continue to build out what we've started to do, which is um, which is. Uh, licensing sales for our core capability um, and aligning with other products. So um, uh, how do we get built into core, let's say core ERP software or core e-procurement software or you know something like that <clears throat> so that a client doesn't even have to think about working with us. It's just all baked into that software, right? <clears throat> Pardon me. And so, so that's part of the vision. The other part of the vision is how do we ensure that the results of our efforts are easy for a client to work into their internal processes? So just producing data or just producing something, if it's an extra step, then it's a hassle for people, 
right? So how do we make sure, and part of this is integration with other software, that sort of thing, but how do we make sure what we're doing is really, really easy for our customers to use so that it helps them rather than adds more tasks to their day? Makes sense. So a lot of times I'll see this where the, the company owner, I'm not necessarily saying you are, but the company owner has the vision there, the ideas going forward. How do you bring that down or how, how do you bring that down in your own company to the team to say, okay, there, how do you get them bought into that vision or them understanding that vision internally? I think, um, you know, I, I think anybody doing that has to be comfortable with a lot of uh, kind of a lot of mistakes and ongoing iteration of processes. I may have a short-term view of things that may not be right. My team may be doing stuff that ends up wrong. I have to be okay with that and we have to learn. So, and it's not, that's not a luxury. If you're doing something like we're doing, we have to be a learning organization that is always seeing things that aren't just right and say, okay, that's not, that's not right. Let's take a couple of days, fix it. And then we'll, you know, we'll roll it out again or something like that. Right. So as a software company, we can do that. If we were making something physical, it could, it would be different. Yeah. <clears throat> but as a software company, we can iterate as we're going. Right. And so I think, um, uh, delivering that vision is really helping people understand on an ongoing basis what the original vision is, but then adjusting incrementally on a regular basis. And, um, and those regular adjustments, they may be technology issues where we can't actually do what I want to do. Okay. But that's fine. You know, we iterate and we, and we move along toward that, toward that path. Makes sense. So, running a little long here, running out of time. I always like to kind of come back and we've, we've talked about a bunch of different things over time, but still, what is kind of the best tip, the best strategy that, hey, if I had known this six years ago when we started the company, or if I had, had this in mind, this path in mind, things might've been easier. What, 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 what comes to mind as being your kind of your top idea here that wish I had known this or thought about this or done this earlier? Um, I think, you know, the biggest thing that I would have done is really thought through what I needed in a management team. Um, you know, if you're scaling and you're building, the people who you put in place in a management team are really, really critical. So what I would say is hire lower levels first, and then make sure that the the senior level management team that you're hiring is somebody that you can really trust and someone who can really manage a team. Um, so put off those senior hires as long as possible. And it's going to be painful and it's going to mean you're, you're going to have to work a lot and, you know, that sort of thing. But, um, but hire low first, then hire the upper levels. Okay. Um, and that's almost the opposite of what say, uh, venture capital investor or something would tell you they want to see a management team, but the fact is you need execution, and then you need to build into those senior people that you can really trust to to execute on the vision. That makes sense. That's interesting since we hadn't touched on that one yet. I was figuring you go different directions, but yeah, no, a lot of times I'll see that that especially with the small ones, if you're don't not having to do venture capital or stuff like that, because I do agree there. But a lot of times it is still it's almost more the challenge that was what I run into of. You, you start building out the lower levels and you're still trying to wrap your arms around it for honestly too long before you start introducing that management. But yeah, it's doing that lower level and really understanding what's going on first and making sure you've got a key handle on it before you can start bringing in people and really focusing at that point on, okay, what, even going back to like what you were saying, okay, what's our core focus in the business? This turns into, okay, what's your core focus as a leader to say, okay, what are the aspects that, I don't want to do that. I, I don't enjoy doing that. I don't do well, et cetera, to hire on. But yeah, I like that from the, the focus on, on building out the lower level team first. That makes a lot of sense because a lot of times you'll see startups that, hey, we, we, here's our full suite, C-level suite, all these people we brought in. It's like, okay, who's actually doing the work at this point? So yeah, very cool. Right. That's right. So, yep. So uh, listener wants to learn more about uh, your company, about complete intelligence, about yourself. Where can they go find some more information here? 
Sure. Um, so you can find us on, on the web at uh, completeintel.com. Um, on social media, on Twitter, we're at complete underscore intel. Um, and, you know, just look us up online. And um, we have a lot of interviews, a lot of resources on our website to find out more. Okay. We well, really appreciate it. So thank you for taking time Thanks, out. Jeff. Thank you. Thanks. Have a great day. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Building to Scale podcast. If you would like to share your entrepreneurial business growth story, please visit buildingtoscale.com slash guest. If you got something out of this interview, would you do both us and our guest a favor and share it on your social media accounts? Don't forget to hit subscribe in your player so that you don't miss any future episodes and make sure to reach out to Jeff Chastain on any of the major social media networks or check us out at admentis.com.